Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar Imhotep, with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. Today is April the 21st, 2022, and I'd like to welcome you all to the Mbongi. Today we have a very, very special guest with us, Dr. Hakeem Olusheyi, who is an astrophysicist, a cosmologist, inventor, and educator. And we will talk more about his uh, latest book and see if we can get a few uh, astrophysics questions answered uh, in this program. So all of that and more when we return in just a moment. everyone. Thank you for joining. As always, this is the Mbongi, and this is the place where uh, the community comes together and shares valuable information. And today we are dealing with a science uh, topic, and we have, uh, for the first time on our program, Dr. Hakeem Olusheyi, and we'll uh, introduce him in just a moment. But as always, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you who are joining us from the various different platforms uh, on Facebook, as well as Instagram, as well as uh, now Twitter. Uh, Twitter allows uh, for, for live uh, programming today. So we're on Twitter and of course on YouTube. So shout out to everyone who has made themselves known in the chat and I'm just going to do a few announcements and we will get started. So first and foremost, uh, as you should know, there will be the One Africa Power in Unity Conference on Saturday, April the 30th, 2022, and Sunday, May the 1st. And there is, uh, I think, a total of 15 speakers these two days. So uh, speakers include Dr. Milana Karanga, uh, Shazarad Ali, uh, Professor James Smalls, Brother Riza Islam, uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, uh, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries, Dr. Kaba Hiawatha uh, Kamini, Dr. Susan Tata, Brother Infodishi Chihuni Mess, Dr. Theofalo Binga, Dr. Ken Harris, Brother Jabari Osaze, uh, Professor Bayina Bello, and Dr. Alicia Watkins. And of course, your brother Asari Motep will be speaking. And speaking of Dr. Uh, Tata, she on the Mbongi on Sunday. Now, it's going to be at an, uh, a different time than we're used to um, because she is located in Germany. So we will be going CET time for those of you who are in Europe. And um, so it will be 9 a.m. this coming Sunday, which is, what's that exact date? It will be the 24th. So 9 a.m. CET time uh, on the 24th this Sunday, which is actually going to be 3 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. So if you're up late, like many of y'all do, you want to catch the live broadcast uh, it, here in the United States, you know, it will be uh, a rather late or early, depending on how you look at it, uh, show. Um, but uh, we will have uh, Dr. Tata on. She hails from Cameroon. And uh, so she will be at the conference. 
and which will be held in Detroit on, again, the 30th of April and May the 1st. And so make sure that you go to uh, hoppyfilm.com to get your tickets. And this is the link um, be below, H-A-P-I-F-I-L-M.com. So it will be live stream. And of course, uh, we will be physically in the house in Detroit uh, that weekend. And so hopefully I get to, you know, go to Ma Duke's basement and, and, and rub Jay Dilla's uh, turntables and MPC. We'll see if they allow that. Uh, but make sure y'all uh, go to the link and check it out. And uh, lastly, reminding everyone that at the end of August, I will be releasing Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume 1, towards a meaning for the place name Kemet. So keep your ears to the streets. And uh, I'll let you know more and more uh, the closer we get to the release date. So, oh, I forgot to mention that in regards to uh, Dr. Tata, she also has a, <coughs> excuse me, um, a YouTube channel, Pan-African TV, and I will be interviewed uh, on her platform on Friday at 3.45 p.m. Eastern Time. And so if you want to catch me live on her show, uh, I will, you know, have the link below and I'll be advertising um, for her platform. Uh, so, you know, make sure y'all check that out tomorrow if y'all want to uh, check that out. And so now I am going to introduce our very special guest with us. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we have with us Dr. Hakeem Olusheyi, who is the author of the critically acclaimed memoir, A Quantum Life, My Unlikely Journey from the Streets to the Stars, and is an internationally recognized astrophysicist, science TV personality, and global education advocate who has a long and distinguished career in academia and scientific research. Most recently, he was stationed at NASA headquarters, where he served as an astrophysicist and space science education lead for NASA science mission directive. In addition, he was a professor of aerospace, physics, and space sciences at the Florida Institute of Technology since 2007. A former TED fellow, uh, Dr. Olusheyi, holds three degrees, eight U.S. patents, four EU patents, and co-host several shows of science uh, of the, on the Science Channel and Discovery International, including Outrageous Acts of Science, How the Universe Works, Space's Deepest Secrets, Strange Evidence, You Have Been Born, and Strip the Cosmos. Dr. Olusheyi's success is even more impressive given his incredible personal background and story motivating audiences globally with his message of persevering past naysayers, self-doubt, and seemingly immovable obstacles. And he also hails from New Orleans. So we'll see uh, if he's still into etouffee and, and what he knows about Boudin and the like. So without further ado, I want to welcome to the program, Dr. Hakeem Olusheyi. Oh, I forgot to mention his middle name, Muata. That's Hakeem right. Muata Olusheyi. Welcome <laughs> to the Mbongi. Thank you, sir. I'm happy to be here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you you pronounce my name correctly. That almost never happens. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a linguist, so I'm familiar with the wow. Yoruba language. Wonderful. wonderful. And so, because uh, I, I hear people uh, pronounce it without the sh. That's right. And with this, so I, I wanted to make sure that, you know, so maybe we can pass out the fonts. So they, they can see the diagram. Yeah, that's a good idea. And under yeah. your the, the S uh, for your name. But uh, welcome to the Mbongi. Uh, it is Thank an you. honor to have you here. And I am truly grateful. And I look forward to this conversation. And uh, since you are new here, and yes. there may be many who may not know you, uh, just to tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, where you're from, what right. got you into 
And I know that's kind of a long story, but what got yeah. you into yeah. uh, science in general, right. yeah. but, you know, astrophysics in particular? Right, right. Ahead. Yeah. Okay. So um, in terms of who I am and where I come from, so I come from a father who was born in Mississippi, in rural Mississippi, 1933, and my mother's born in New Orleans, 1944. Um, and so those were like the places where I spent my childhood and my mom's family kind of split off and went to L.A. So I also spent my childhood partly in South Central L.A. Um, and, you know, I've, I've always been fascinated with the natural world and pretty much just weird stuff. Right. So, you know, ghosts, Loch Ness Monster, uh, <laughs> the Yeti, or, you know, the stuff they used to have on Time Life books. Right. When I was a kid. Um, so I'm 55. So, you know, I was a kid in the 70s. Okay. Uh, so, you know, if you remember back then, there was no internet. <laughs> <laughs> what happened with me, man, you know, is I was born in New Orleans and I'm, you know, we moved every year. And so at the age of nine, I moved to the country in Mississippi. And that time ended up for me being sort of like a blossoming of my mental uh, faculties. So a couple of things happened, right? One happened at school and the other stuff happened at home. So mm -hmm. at home, you know, I'm in the country for the first time. And, you know, the country life was full of the natural world that I'm amazed by. So, you know, I'm just checking out everything I can. And of course, they're working my little butt to death. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a city boy coming mm -hmm. to the country, right? So, um, but at school though, you know, they had a system where they tracked us. So that meant that, you know, in my grade, the fourth grade, we were organized allegedly based on ability. And right. my friends and I noticed that all the black students were in the groups three and four, the two bottom groups. And the way the system was set up, you know, you went through these levels independently, no matter what group you were in. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to blast through these levels and show them, you know, oh, you think you're superior to me? I'm going to show you. Right. So. You know, I worked my way all the way up to group one and was the first to complete the grade, right? So that was sort of like the blossoming. And then the next year, man, oh, the other thing that happened that year is I decided to read a, an adult book for the first time. And I read Roots by Alex Haley. And mm -hmm. it just blew my mind, right? So uh, the following year, so one thing about us is we moved every year, right? So, you know, I was second grade in LA, third grade in New Orleans, fourth grade in Mississippi, fifth grade <laughs> back in New Orleans, you know, sixth grade, I ended up living in um, nine different households and attending five schools across three states from the age of 11 to 13, right? So, wow. yeah, so when I was 10, you know, I was back in New Orleans and I decided to read uh, our encyclopedias from A to Z, you know, just a bored kid, right, at home mm -hmm. by myself. And I get to E and I discover Albert Einstein in Relativity. Right. And, mm. you know, that's like time dilation, time travel, length contraction, space time, all the stuff you see in Marvel comics. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's how it really manifests in the actual physical world in which we live. Right. And so I just became fascinated by it, felt like I had to learn it. And so I just went to studying relativity <laughs> as a 10 year old kid. Right. Um, and then later, you know, when I'm in high school, computers come out. I'm back in Mississippi now, finally settled down. And my mm -hmm. um, girlfriend gets a little TRS-80 computer. And uh, I use that computer to teach myself the programming language basic, right? Mm -hmm. So ultimately what happens is these professors come to my little high school, right? So I was like all black Heidelberg High School, public school, a mile down the road from all white Heidelberg Academy, right? Mm -hmm. so they come there doing outreach. They tell us about science fairs. And so I'm like, OK, I'll, I'll program relativity, you know, not mm -hmm. realizing that, you know, this is 1983, 84. Right. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, some little kid in the woods is supposed to be doing that. So I end up going to first place in physics in the Mississippi State Science Fair. Right. Mm. Yeah, so that's kind of where it all started from. So in an in, in autodidact, uh, uh, um, a self-motivated uh, or inspired learner. Yeah, and you know, um, your story in in many aspects is similar to mine, because um, my my father is from New Orleans. Ah, uh, but he was actually born in Opelousas, so my okay. family is mainly Opelousas, 
New Orleans. Right, right. And my mother, well, she was born in Germany, but she, mm -hmm. her, her family, well, her mother's side is from Texas in mm -hmm. San Antonio. Yeah. Her father's side is from New Orleans. Oh, and wow. so like so basically yeah. seventy five percent of my family Louisiana in 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 those yeah, uh, two yeah. spaces. So when uh, I was born, both of my mother and father were in the Navy, oh, and so that's, that's why I moved a ah, lot, you know, because yeah. of because of them. And then after they got out, uh, I would have grown I would have grown up in New Orleans, um, but he found a job in Houston. Ah. That's where we ended up uh, uh, being. Yeah. So but, we, um, so we're still in the same communities because yeah. guess what I did after high school? I went in the Navy. Yeah. See. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. And it's interesting. So now, here's here's something also in reverse. Uh, so you, when you're younger, you're interested because you went to the encyclopedia and you came across Einstein and dealing yeah. with relativity. Well, it's not for me until like relatively recent. Um, I'm getting into it uh, because of my ancient Egyptian studies and and Bantu studies. Yeah, yeah. So you just reminded me, and I had this in the car as well: the mathematics of relativity for the rest of us. Oh wow! Uh, that I'm nice, going nice. through, uh, trying to better understand it uh, for a text that I'm writing uh, called uh, "Quantum Mechanics as African Heritage." Nice and. And this is, you know, one of the reasons why we, uh, it's, a, it's a few uh, colleagues of, uh, of mine, we created Black Science Month, which we celebrate in October. Oh, nice. And, you know, one of the things we like to do is to bring forth, mm. you know, um, Black scholars so that people right. see, yeah. you know, Black people, African Absolutely. people doing, doing science and doing other things so they can be like, oh, that's something I can, you know, uh, aspire to. So coincidentally, I don't know if you know this, but I'm now president of the National Society of Black Physicists. Uh, yeah, so yes. I have a whole lot of scientists for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love to meet them. I love to meet them. <laughs> and yeah. um, so, you know, you, you talked about the aspects of your childhood, and this is right. very central to the, the book you published. That's right. Uh, titled A Quantum Life my unlikely journey from the street to the stars. Now, um, I just ordered the book, so oh, I'll be going through it. Maybe we can do a book club on the, on the channel yeah, yeah. of this. Because I, I kept seeing, I, I, I hadn't heard of you before, but I kept seeing this book oh, really? on my timeline in wow. all my social media. So yeah. I'm like, who is this? Let me... Yeah. Take a look at, at at this. And then, you know, when I started, you know, reading about your story and, and stuff like this, I'm like, oh, I got to have a conversation with them. I'm one of them. Man, you ain't seen nothing the yet. <laughs> and <laughs> Wait. so, yeah. So if you could just give us a, a, a little bit about what the book is about. Right. right. And, and what made the journey unlikely. Oh, uh, in the first place that it, it, it made the subtitle. That's right. Yeah. So. The book is written in four parts, right? So it's, okay. uh, let me see here. So here's here's a copy right here. Okay. Or is it three parts? I forget. Oh yeah, four parts. So the first part is titled Ghetto Child, all right? Mm. It's about my childhood. So like I said, I spent it in New Orleans East, mm -hmm. New Orleans Ninth Ward, South Central Los Angeles, Houston Third Ward, Houston South Park, right? The hood and all those things, <laughs> right? Now, part two is called Coming of Age in Mississippi. So this mm -hmm. is the time period. So my so I for, for a decade, we journeyed. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so in it, I describe how I fall in love with the natural world and science, but also describe my relationship with my family and my community, right? Which mm -hmm. my pet name for it is crime school. So mm -hmm. I had three male first cousins who in the, in the early 70s, you know, I moved to LA in 1971. They were all members, they were Crips, okay? And ultimately they uh, rob banks and do worse and two, go to prison for a couple of decades, all right? Mm -hmm. And they both got out around the early 2000s. One maintained a, a drug habit and crack, right? And also went back to Robin Banks and went right back to prison where he is today, right? My other cousin, mm -hmm. you sat down with him today, you never knew he spent the day in prison, right? Just a chill dude. Um, mm -hmm. 
And so on my father's side, you know, my father's side was very entrepreneurial. So he was from Mississippi to country. So they were bootleggers in addition to being <laughs> farmers. OK, mm -hmm. so my dad goes away to the Korean War, comes back, takes the business to the next level. He's importing marijuana into the port of New Orleans, you know, massive weight. Right. And, and growing it in Mississippi. And so when I get reunited with my dad, you know, my parents divorce at four. We go away to the West. When I come back and I'm reunited with my dad for a year at the age from nine to ten, I get incorporated mm -hmm. to the business. Right. So we go live in Mississippi. And, you know, I'm alone at home and people come. You know, we were selling Canadian mist. Uh, Seagram's Gin, Bumpy Head, <laughs> TJ Swan, mm -hmm. right? Nick bags and dime bags, right? That's, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what we had. So the adults would be like, this is this, this is that, that's that. We'll be back whenever. And I'm my little nine-year-old self, you know, transact the business. So that was like just normal life for me, right? Mm -hmm. And you know how it is. You know, my cousins were Crips. Back then, you know, this is when cats are wearing, you know, we got bell bottoms, afros, and, you know, mm -hmm. it, 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 it you know, my family was one where they were, you know, they like to send a message if things ever got violent, you know, mm -hmm. they were like fast and furious. Right. And so, you know, you're born into that, mm -hmm. you know, you're born into your family's reputation, you're born into your family's business. And, you know, that, you know, so, you know, my story isn't like everybody in the hood, you know how it is in the community. Mm -hmm. It's a distribution of people. Right. So by the time I'm 13, 14, I'm selling joints at school. I'm the only dude selling joints at my school. In Mississippi. Not like, you know, you, you know, the outsiders, they think, oh, everybody in the black community is the hood just because it's, right. it's not like that. We were outliers, right? Indeed. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, that's what makes it so unlikely, man. And so the other thing about it that I describe is the 10 years of that journey mm -hmm. between the age of 10 and four, four and 14. You know, I suffered so much abuse. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my mom would leave me with people. And, you know, every time the man in the house would abuse me in some way, usually beating me, right? Mm -hmm. uh, working the hell out of me. You know, there was this one dude, James Davis, because I joke a lot, he would wake me up in the middle of the night and make me read Bible verses about being a fool, right? <laughs> so, you know, by the time I'm like 13, you know, you're, you're the kid out and alone. You know, you don't, it's not your hood, right? Yeah. You're out alone. You're a new kid always in the hood. Yeah. You learn really quickly. It's better for me to punch you in the face than you punch me in the face. Right? <laughs> so, you know, I adopt the sort of, you know, how we do, right? You know, so in, in, in high, you know, eighth grade, everybody's still little kids that were playing football. I'm smoking cigarettes, being Mr. Cool Guy. Ninth grade, you know, I'm selling joints. I'm going out <laughs> to the bars and the juke joints, you know, in Mississippi, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, I, I take on that persona. By the time I'm 16, I'm carrying a gun, you know, you know. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So it's, yeah. it's it's an identity that you adopt. It's like an identity that I see in my family and it's an identity that I feel like the world is telling me that's who and what you are, right? Indeed. And it's what, what I like about your story is, you know, because I grew up in some of those same places. So I know about uh, Lower Ninth Ward. That's that's yeah. where my grandmother and, and, and everyone stayed. Yeah. And uh, South Park in Houston, Texas, yeah. third ward, the trade, what we call it. Um, and but it's, it's, it's as you say, uh, use the word distri distribution, but it's a variety of people there. Yeah. And even even there, there's people who are involved or had been involved in the. Uh, you know, what we call the dark side of the force. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but who are brilliant minds. Oh, absolutely. Who yeah. just need, you know, a push in the right direction. Someone yeah. to yeah. see yeah. what something in them. Yeah. And or they just didn't have certain opportunities. So they right. only right. saw this narrow path. Yeah. You know, yeah. To, let, let, to me, let me tell you something that's complimentary to what you're saying. Oh, you ahead. know, certain venues <clears throat> where I get interviewed more mm -hmm. mainstream venues, you know? So, so my life evolves to the point when the time I'm 21, you know, uh, you know what happens in 1986, the crack cocaine epidemic jumps uh, on, right? So everybody I know and myself, we get caught up in it. I'm caught up in it 21 to 25, right? Yeah. And so, you know, the end period of that was when I was at graduate school at Stanford, okay? You know, at Tougaloo College undergraduate, Stanford graduate school. So I go to these venues and they're like, how could you have been doing that while pursuing a physics PhD at Stanford. 
And I'll say to them, I'm like, well, you know, statistically, I wasn't the only one. <laughs> you know, it's not like they let a Negro in here and he did these drugs. No, 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 no. There's a lot of drugs that are being done there today, yesterday, the day before. But the difference is if you have a particular identity, it becomes your identity and you're criminalized. Whereas for others, because I can't tell you, you know, I do corporate speaking. And I can't tell you how many times I tell my story with the scientists, with the corporate cats, and the CEO come over afterwards and is like, yeah, let me tell you about what I did, you know, <laughs> what I was done, right? But you wouldn't get that, you know, the, 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 the mainstream messaging, especially that our young people uh, experience, is that certain things happen in the hood because it's the hood. But the reality yeah. is people are people in every community, and they're all doing the same things. You know, from the, the very good and the very bad. So if you only see good in your community and only see bad in someone else's community, you trip it because mm -hmm. humans are a distribution, right? You know, you take any group of human beings, there's going to be a distribution of anything and everything. Choose any characteristic you wish. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be identical. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we are different one from the other. We are all unique individuals, you know. And it... um it, it it reminds me of a, a discussion that a, a few uh, uh, colleagues and I, you know, were having because it that's that message which you just said seems to be, of course, missing in in the mainstream conversation. And it, you know, for for those of us in Africology, of course, we're looking at the, you know, what are the societal causes that that motivate or inspire people to behave in a particular way hmm. what what are the what are driving lack in one area and how does this affect you know um, uh, you know a particular group or being or human beings like what is what is what is cultural and what is human like you know the, mm. the the discussion about you know what what it means to be human right and, and how does humans deal with conflict yeah, you know, in these various different manners, and what influence culture may have is never really part of the deeper conversation right. in in mainstream, and so mm -hmm. they only look at it through these very narrow lenses. Black and, and of white. Of course, you get these stereotypes. Oh, they exactly. must be, and da da da. Not seeing the young astrophysicists, you know, uh, in in the in the works, or you know, that's right, absolutely. Yeah. And that. You know what you so, said? It just reminded me of something that one of my colleague said to me he's a he's a brother that i knew at stanford he was a grad student his mm -hmm. name is damien Rusan. now he's the head of a um of a research group at lawrence berkeley lab brilliant mm -hmm. brother right so i told him a bit about my life when i was a grad student okay and mm -hmm. what had happened with me was when i was at tougaloo uh you know when i got into that dark world when i got over there to that dark side you know my grades just plummeted so i dropped out OK, mm -hmm. and this is 1988. So I get the job I could get, which was as a janitor at a hotel. And, you know, I'm making four dollars an hour. <laughs> OK, I'm broke as I'll get out. And most of the days I would eat by walking the hallways where people get their leftover room service. They put the tray outside their door. You know, I would eat mm -hmm. their people's yeah. leftovers. Right. And so uh, a bellhop gets fired. And to me, this is my big break because you get tips, you get a hundred dollars in a day. I'm mm -hmm. barely making a hundred dollars a week, you know. So I go for the bellhop job, and they're like, "No, not you. You don't. You, you get go back to the back. <laughs> You're not the guy we put in front of the door." So my Damien tells me we're reunited in 2013. Right? We knew each yeah. other in the 90s. 2013. I've been doing research in Berkeley, and he hits me on social media, and he's like, "Yo, I live in Ber Berkeley." Good, let's holler, mm -hmm. right? So we had, and he tells me, he's like, Hakeem, you know that story you told me about being a janitor? He's like, I've told that story to so many people over the years because to me, that story encapsulates what it's like to be a black man in America. Mm -hmm. Whoever was evaluating you for that position of bellhop didn't realize that the guy standing before them was a PhD physicist. <laughs> right? They didn't see that. Indeed. And, um, and, and, Speaking of that, I want to shift it to the the astrophysics part. Yeah. Now, the title of your text is a 
a quantum life. Yes. Is are you more specialized in quantum mechanics mm. or is just, of course, the knowledge of quantum, quantum fields, just part of astrophysics as a whole? You got to learn it anyway. Yeah, it's, just, it's the latter. It's the yeah. latter. Yeah. OK. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the, the, you know, quantum mechanics is almost like the. If, you know, you're not qualified to get your PhD until you go through quantum mechanics, right? So the way I like to uh, put it, you know, we divide physics into like these three levels. So the first two levels we call classical physics. So this is like the study of motion of like regular objects. You know, we yeah. call it like classical mechanics. And then there's the study of fields, electric fields, magnetic fields. Okay. And mm -hmm. gravity is included in that. Then... The, well, the thing about that is that the mathematics that underpins it is vector calculus. Now, for me, <laughs> it was hard. I was vastly undereducated mathematically. Mm -hmm. But to physicists generally, vector calculus, oh, a trained monkey can do that, right? That's their attitude, mm -hmm. all right? <laughs> At the next level up is what we call statistical mechanics and, and thermodynamics, you know, how collections of matter, gases, liquids, you know, how you how they behave gives us refrigeration and all these kind of things. And quantum mechanics, right? The study of the microscopic world. And the thing about those two is that they rely heavily of the mathematics of probability and statistics and what is known as linear algebra. And so those are the two when you're a graduate student that you have to pass in your qualifying exam to prove that you belong in the building, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the 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 you know the line that's drawn there now there's a third level <laughs> which is quantum field theory and cause and, and general relativity the study of space time right it's the quantum theory of fields basically right and the, and the uh mathematics there is what we call tensor calculus and those are for like the exceptional people right who be, who are going to become theorists so personally I don't specialize as much as scientists tend to, you know, mm -hmm. so I've often called myself a science mercenary. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I started off doing um, building a rocket with Art Walker, my PhD advisor, uh, to study the sun's atmosphere. Right. So that involved optics as well as the, the study of plasmas and space based research. Then I go to Silicon Valley and work on making computer chips. Right. That's where I get all my patents. Then I go into cosmology and work on building a satellite, right? Then I start doing what's, you know, and, you know, I do all these different things because the tools, you know, the toolbox of computation, mathematics, and an understanding of like electronics and plasmas can take you very far, right? <laughs> now, the, uh, your PhD dissertation. Yes. And it, it has to deal with the sun, as you yes. said, and, and the atmosphere yes. of the sun. Yes. How does one get inspired to write about and to study mm. the atmosphere of the sun? Like what what is like yeah. what what was the motivation? Like this is what I'm going to write about. And yeah. what was what was lacking yeah. in the field? Well, let me tell you what's lacking in every interview. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a perspective of where I'm coming from. Mm. For me, it was never, oh, here is what, what do I wish to do? Oh, I'll do that. It wasn't that. Uh, it was, oh, I need to live indoors and eat tomorrow. How am I going to make that happen? <laughs> oh, where's the safe place? I see. Okay. So when I learn, so what's happening is after I drop out of Tougaloo, I, I, I realize I'm going nowhere unless I get a degree. So I go back to Tougaloo. And this woman who was completing her PhD in physics at MIT shows up on campus with a couple of other MIT graduate students, Aya Koot Mock, who's now a Morehouse professor, and this dude named Claude Poo, right? And they were starting this new conference they call the National Conference of Black Physics Students. And they told us they'll take us to MIT and tell us, you know, how to become a physicist, right? And so I'm like, sure. And it's there. I, I became a physics major, not because I wanted to be a physicist, but because I was bombing all my classes. And when I stepped into a physics class, I discovered that without even attending class, I could just show up for the exams and bust 100s because I had done so much physics for fun as a kid studying Einstein. 
right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I used to do these logic problems. My mom would do Dell crossword puzzle books, and she was only interested in the crosswords. And I was real, I'd really get into the logic problem. So I developed, I taught myself logic really well, right? And so physics is just like raw logic. And, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and so anyway, I became a physics major because that's what was easy. And then they let me know that the next step through this conference is going to graduate school. And here are the graduate schools you want to apply to. And I heard that Stanford had graduated 30 black PhDs in physics. So I didn't even know that Stanford was some highfalutin university. I knew they graduated 30 <laughs> black PhDs in physics. Mm -hmm. All right. When I get there, there's one black professor, Art Walker. I'm working for you. <laughs> right? I'm trying to succeed here. All right. I'm trying to make this work. Anywhere else ain't safe for me. OK, so he happened to do what it is I wanted to do. I like weird stuff as far as what I knew at the time. Astrophysics was the weird stuff. I wasn't into mm -hmm. space. I wasn't into the sun. I wasn't into it. The, the normal stuff you think of is not how it was. Mm -hmm. I was into Art Walker. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. And I knew I was good with my hands, right? And I had done research in the summers, you know, so I knew what I had, what my abilities were. And so I was mm -hmm. like, it would be great if I could do exper space based experimentation. And that's exactly what he did. So the uh. fact that we were looking at the sun was kind of irrelevant to me. We could have been looking at anything. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I always wonder, like when I when I go through, like, because I always want to know the journey. Yeah, like, what yeah. is what led you here? Yeah, like yeah. you know, um, and oh, and let me tell you, by the way, okay. how I ended up at Stanford. Oh, go ahead. They're the ones who offered me the biggest stipend. They beat out LSU by three thousand dollars, eleven thousand to fourteen thousand. Right, wow. I'm like, I'm going there. Right, I had no idea what it was. I didn't know what I was getting into. You know. I chose my first university because um, I had applied to all these schools on the East Coast. I was still in Texas at the time. But, you know, Southwest Texas State University offered me the most money to go. That's where I'm going. It was That's just that simple. Easy, <laughs> yeah. easy peasy. I didn't look at the program or yeah. anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to ask you now some just a few questions regarding uh, some topics about astrophysics. And Ooh, that, that I see you yeah. uh, discuss and but but ones also that, you know, in in my social media circles, we are also engaged in. Yeah. Of course, we're not astrophysicists. I'm a computer scientist, but nowhere near an astrophysicist. So you, you well, mean I have wise, a man. It, it's starting to feel like being an astrophysicist means being a computer scientist these days. Basically. <laughs> yeah. Because everybody's everybody's coding and, yep. and, and the like. So I know an electrical engineer, she codes. Yeah. Uh, because it's it's now essential to everything. Um yeah. into everything. But the the big bang. Yeah. You know, what is the big bang? Yes. And and how can we better explain that it was not an actual explosion? Right, right. Uh, yeah. You know, so yeah. so the the Big Bang standard model. Yeah. What what is what is that? Right. So the first thing I want to say is, man, one of the most important things I learned from Art Walker uh -huh. is what it means to know something. Okay? Mm. So I have this. The very first TED talk I did was back in like 2009, and it was titled "The Big Bang: How We Know." Because, you know, I felt like when we discuss science as scientists, like, oh, I'm going to tell the people who aren't scientists what we know. <laughs> That's what they do. They tell us. They tell the society what we know. But they don't say how we know it, typically. Mm -hmm. So people are like, what? That sounds crazy. I don't believe any of it, right? No one was there, you know. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> so in order to go with what we know, you got to also get into how we know. And the thing about this is, you know, I've been doing this test for 20 years. I go, I'm teaching a class on astrophysics, right? And you cover the Big Bang. I ask my students this question. As a show of hands, how many of you believe in the Big Bang, right? Some mm -hmm. students raise their hand. Then I'll say, how many of you disbelieve in the Big Bang? Certain number of students raise their hand. And I say, okay, for those of you who believe in the Big Bang, explain to me Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And they're looking at me like, what? <laughs> Never heard of it. And I'm like, okay, explain to me. I say, do you understand the cosmic microwave background radiation? And they'll say something like, yeah, 
And I'm like, okay, explain acoustic oscillations to me. And they're like, huh, I have no idea. I'm like, okay, how many of you understand Hubble expansion? So people heard of Hubble. People know the universe is expanding. They're like, yeah, I know about that. I'm like, okay, well, tell me about co-moving coordinates. And they'll say, oh, don't know anything about that. So then I point this out to them. I say, listen, those two, those three things, nucleosynthesis, the cosmic microwave background radiation, and uh, Hubble expansion are the observational foundations of the Big Bang model. So if you don't understand those, you don't understand even what the Big Bang model is. So you're not in a position to believe or disbelieve. But the second part of that is the word I use is believe. And that's not how we come to understand the nature of the physical world. To me, to believe something means to accept it as true without confirming it to be true. Right. Mm. We only know things. <laughs> right. <laughs> we only say this is true when it's been confirmed to be true because it's been observed to be true over and over and over again. Right. So the way the what the Big Bang is about is how our universe as a whole has evolved over the last 13.8 billion years. And mm -hmm. so the big problem started when we looked around, you know, think about one of the questions I like to ask my students is, you know, I ask them two questions, right? The first question is a setup. I say, what is matter made of? And they usually give me the right answer, atoms, right? I'm like, yeah, great answer. Then I'll say, where does light come from? And they go, the sun? And I'm like, hey, if you're, in a, if you're at night, you're in a room, there's light, there's no sun. They're like, oh, energy. I'm like, no, energy is something that is possessed. It is, you know, light possesses energy. It doesn't come from energy. And they're like, oh, I don't, I don't know. And I give them the answer that I'm looking for. I say, the, the simple answer is matter makes it. That's where light comes from. And the thing about the way that works is when matter makes light, the signature of what the matter is and what the matter is doing is encoded in the light. And so what we do is we learn how to read the message in the light. But the key thing here is that it's unique. Specific physical processes have specific light fingerprints. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here was the problem that motivated the whole thing back in the 1940s. When we looked around everywhere and we measured the chemical composition of everything in the cosmos, we found that it was all made of the same stuff everywhere we looked, which was crazy because stars change the chemical composition. Stars cook hydrogen into helium, helium into carbon and oxygen, carbon and oxygen into heavier elements, right? That's where they're made. So the stars to your right are doing different things than the stars to your left, right? You know, it's like if, if, if I have two areas and they are identical, and I separate them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have people doing something over here and people doing something over there. Many years later, those two places are going to look very different one from the other. Mm -hmm. right? It's yeah. the same way with the universe. So why is it the same everywhere? So they had just discovered the expansion of the universe, and we had just discovered nuclear physics. So this group of three physicists run by this cat, Alpha Gamov, they looked at the problem and they found that if the everywhere in the universe was as hot as the center of a star, you could create nuclear fusion at the, just like a star does in its core. So the question then is, if you start doing that, right? So what we saw was that everywhere we look, it was about 75% hydrogen, 25% helium, all right? Take 1% from one of them to get the other stuff in the universe. So how do you get that ratio of 75% to 25%? So what they found was if you just start off with a super hot universe that's super dense, you just crush everything down, all the hydrogen ends up converting to helium hmm. by nuclear cooking, basically, right? But if you start adding light, the more light you add, the less helium you get. So what happens is they find that the magic number to get what we see, 75% hydrogen, 25% helium, is if you have one photon of light for every proton of matter, all right? Mm -hmm. So that now is a prediction of the model. So now you can go and look, well, is there a billion photons of light for every one proton of matter? I mentioned that phrase a few times, the cosmic microwave background radiation. Well, that's those billion photons that were predicted. They were actually observed by these two Bell Labs engineers, Penzias and Wilson, for which they ultimately won the Nobel Prize, right? Mm -hmm. So 
the big bang model is basically at its simplest understanding that our entire universe what we call our universe now this region was once compressed to super dense super high densities and super high temperatures and then it evolved from there by expanding and then you know matter evolving under gravity and that's what it is and so as the universe evolves from that state at particular uh stages you can look at how the physics works and then predict what should we be able to observe today that was created at that time in the universe so you make the prediction then you go and look and see if it's there and every time we do that not only is it there is there to an incredibly high precision right so this whole idea of the big bang you know a lot of people the first thing to understand to people is that this is not a hypothesis this is an observed mm -hmm. reality it's one of the most sound and solid observed realities in all of existence you know mm -hmm. yeah so you mentioned that you know matter makes light is it is it safe to by analogy say that light essentially is the sweat of moving matter uh it's a, like a yeah it's it, it, it's kind of like well you know the way i look at it is the following now this might get a little crazy okay so ultimately as physicists what we realize of what really exists like matter is an illusion mass doesn't really exist that equation e equals mc squared you know, everybody thinks of it as nuclear bombs, stars, matter converted into energy. That's not really what it means. Albert Einstein told us immediately what it means. We started looking at it differently. And now we're realizing, oh, you, you know what, Albert, you were actually right. <laughs> the only thing that really exists are two things, energy and fields. OK, mm -hmm. so you know how every when we say matter, we talk about electrons and protons. When we say atoms they are made of protons, neutrons and electrons. One thing about those things, electrons, is that they're all identical. Protons are all identical. You can't tell one from the other, right? Mm -hmm. So you know what that means when something is that? If that's the case with something, that means that it is not the real thing. It is not mm -hmm. the actual thing. Let me give you an example. Suppose I give you a guitar or a, or a piano. Every C note that you play, doom, they are identical. But the C... The note that you hear is not the real thing. The real thing is vibrating air or the string that started vibrating to vibrate the air, right? That's the real tangible thing. But you call that, oh, what's that? That's a C, doom, mm -hmm. right? But a C isn't a real thing, you know? A note doesn't exist. So think of an electron as like a, a, an excitation of this field that exists everywhere in the universe. So basically what happens is at the earliest moment of the universe, the field that constitutes matter, what we call fermionic fields, get filled with energy. Boom, right? But now, since then, all that energy that is in us, in matter, has been moving out of us into the electromagnetic field. All right? The electromagnetic field where light exists is a different realm. It's a different field. We, Our field interacts with that field, but fields don't necessarily all interact. That's why things like neutrinos, right now we have all kinds of elementary particles passing through us. We have cosmic neutrinos, we have muons from the upper atmosphere, we have the cosmic microwave background radiation, there may be um, dark matter. And the reason why we don't know it exists, it passed through the Earth like it's not here, is because those fields don't interact, right? So they just pass mm -hmm. through each other. So if you look at the matter in the universe, look out at night and see what the matter is doing. You call it stars, but really what's happening is this matter getting the damn energy squeezed out of it and being put into the electromagnetic field. Mm -hmm. And then as it travels through intergalactic space, because space is expanding, the wavelength of the light gets stretched out by the exact same amount space expanded while the light was traveling to it, through it. When we talk about the cosmological redshift, that's what that is. That's that stretched out of light. So the light loses its energy by that stretching. Right. And so if you look at the evolution of the universe, the number of photons in the universe, the amount of light increases with time, the amount of energy in matter decreases with time and the amount of energy in light also decreases with time because of the expansion of Earth 
And then all the matter is destined to be dumped into black holes. <laughs> right. Quick question uh, along those lines. The because we 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 had a major debate uh, in my social media sphere because the the language that scientists and physicists use when it comes to energy, they make it seem as if it is a substance, yeah. that it is a thing. Yeah. But we read in other literature that it is more so a measurement, a property of matter. Mm. So when we say that something is infused with energy, yeah, what what are we saying in in yeah. in in actuality? Right, right. In right. in this yeah. context, yeah. yeah. So you know, like heat is a flow of energy, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm matter, I'm running. You know, that's a flow of energy, right? Kinetic energy in one half mv squared, right? Um, but what is energy, right? So there's another term that has the exact same units of as energy, called work. Right. Force time distance work. So the way we think of it is energy is like the potential to make things happen. And work is the manifestation of those things actually occurring. So one example is when I lift my phone here, it goes to a higher gravitational potential energy. Mm -hmm. Right. So Albert Einstein, when he formulated e equals MC square, he had a question like this. If I raise my phone I've added energy to it, gravitational potential energy. Does it become heavier? He said, if I add some stuff to it called heat, it has no mass. I have a chunk of metal. If I add heat to it, does it become heavier? If I have a hot piece of metal, it's giving stuff away, light that's flowing out of it. It's hot and glowing. That light has no mass. Does it become lighter? And the answer in every question is, Yes, it becomes heavier. Yes, it becomes lighter. And what he found, it was as if you added a tiny amount of mass M that's equal to the energy, either added or subtracted, divided by the speed of light squared. So he didn't write E equals MC squared. He wrote M equals E divided by C squared, right? So energy is the fundamental nature of making it happen. Yeah. All right. And that there is no better. And it's possessed by things and it can pass from one thing to another. Right. But, you know, <laughs> it's co it's complicated. Right. <laughs> Indeed. Now, I don't know. I don't remember what year you were. I don't know if it was like last year or, or, or any time earlier, but you were on. um Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson's. Oh, yeah. Uh, this year and talk. last year. Yeah. So last year. And, and so, this year. <laughs> I'm sorry. And this year. I've done it so, twice. Last May and this like January, February. All righty. Yeah. Well, well, one, I believe it was your first time on. Okay. So, so it, it may have been the, uh, the one from yeah, last year. year. So you briefly mentioned a, a, a hypothesis, a, a thought experiment that you had in terms of there possibly have been, you know, four essential big bangs or something that. Oh happened. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And multiple and bangs. They, they kind of, you know, a joke was said or something like that, but you never got to uh, explain explore that, that, okay. and I wanted to see if you could. Uh, right. You so know, remember the only thing that exists is fields. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so for, to me, a bang is energy going from one field to another field mm -hmm. and making stuff happen. So the earliest moment in the creation of our universe that we can actually probe and go back to physically, we have a word for it. It's called inflation, this early moment. And we have no way of knowing. We don't know yet how inflation occurred. But we cannot hypothesize our best guess. And the best guess is that there was this field that we call the inflaton field. And it was at an unstable state at a higher energy, and it fell down to lower energy. And when it did, that energy, we call that event reheating, went into the fermionic field, that is the field of matter, and created a bunch of matter, but it also caused the space field to rapidly expand. 
like great, like super rapidly, like it hasn't done since, like just like, blah, blah, you know. <laughs> so what happens is when matter is created from space, which it does, everywhere in space around us, within us, little particles of matter, matter, antimatter pairs are popping into and out of existence on incredibly short time scales. Tiny fractions of a second, 10 to the minus 22. So think 0 0.0002101 of a second, all right? That's how fast this is happening. When that happens in a very early universe and the universe is undergoing this inflation, they're pulled apart from each other, right? And so they must become real particles in our universe. So boom, right? So this we see this all the time, making particles out of just energy, right? We can do that. We can take the light energy and create particles in these bubble chamber experiments is how they were doing it, you know, 100 years ago. So uh, it's called pair production. So what happens is we live in a universe of matter, not equal amounts of matter and antimatter. So somehow you had to get rid of the antimatter. So the other like, you know, tuning of the program is somehow for every billion particles of antimatter, there were a billion plus one particles of matter. So the billion cancels the billion and you get a billion photons and you have one particle of matter remaining, right? Mm -hmm. um, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> the question. No, no it, it, it was just uh, your, I, I, I wanted you to explain. Oh, the bang. It sounded okay. very interesting. So first before. bang. Yeah. First bang. Yeah. Inflaton field goes from high potential to low potential. Boom. Second bang. Space rapidly expands. Boom. Third it, bang. Matter, antimatter come into existence. Pow! Mm -hmm. Right? Third, next bang, matter, antimatter cancel. Pow! And all that energy goes into the electromagnetic field. Now, those were the four bangs I was talking about that day. All mm -hmm. right. Then I thought, well, you know what? You also got to think, think about the recombination stages that occur. You have helium captures electrons, right? Helium captures second electron. Each event, Energy goes from the matter into the electromagnetic field. Then finally, hydrogen captures electron, electrons, and the universe goes from being a pl the primordial fireball, all plasma everywhere, to being all gas, right? Being hydrogen gas. Atoms exist for the first time, 380,000 years after this inflation event. 380,000 yeah. years. Indeed. Well, this would be my last uh science question but it, it it leans on the on the side of almost science fiction to an extent and of course everyone who is uh you know interested in cosmos anything you know beyond our earth always wonders about possible life mm. uh on on other planets and i remember yes. in one conversation you were talking about how if there is life you don't think it was multicellular and then but i, I wanted you to kind of discuss yeah. this this notion that they would kind of be enclosed yes you know yeah. on, yeah. on the yeah. planet and it kind of reminds me of like a, a plato's cave right. situation yeah. Yeah. if, if yeah. you think about it so yeah. i wanted you to, to, okay. to explain it so using the example of earth as the example mm -hmm. for starting life. So, you know, we know certain fundamental things are necessary. You know, you gotta be at a certain temperature range. You have to be shielded from radiation. You need fluids. So to me, the fundamental statement is you need fluids because if you got fluids, you're at the right temperature and you're shielded from radiation. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the history of earth, you know, if you're gonna say, oh, I found, so earth is 4.5 billion years old. If you're going to say, I found life that's 4.4 billion years old, you need to find a rock on Earth that is 4.4 billion years old. Those are impossible to find, right? Because of plate tectonics, the Earth recycles its crust. So there's only a few places where you can find old rocks, right? And so the mm -hmm. oldest rocks we have are 3.8 billion years old, and life is there. We have little crystals, these little zircon crystals, that are 4.2 billion years old that show evidence of organic carbon. And I say that because 
if you look at the ratio, you know, carbon comes with different isotopes. You can add a different numbers of neutron neutrons to the um the number of protons in the nucleus tells you what kind of atom it is. You can add okay. a different number of neutrons, and that's a different isotope of it, right? So life tends to use the lightweight isotopes, the ones with the fewer neutrons. So if you look at um, the ratio of carbon 12 to carbon 14 or carbon 13 to carbon 14, whatever, you know, inorganic matter has a different ratio than organic matter. So inside these zircon crystals are carbon with organic signatures, life signature. OK, yeah. So what does that tell me? That tells me that as early as life could have got started on Earth, it did. So life getting started happens quickly. So where do we find fluids? They're all over the place, but they're always under a super thick layer of, of ice, a super thick atmosphere, or a super th or rock, right? Mm -hmm. So the moon Enceladus of Titan of, 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 of Saturn is a tiny little moon. It has more water than Earth does mm -hmm. but it's not on the surface right the surface is ice the moon titan of saturn right titan has is the only other body in the solar system with surface liquids but they're not water they are like ethane and methane right mm -hmm. hydrocarbons but here's the thing if you lived on titan you would not even know that stars exist because the atmosphere is so darn thick right same with venus so what makes earth special is that it has this transparent atmosphere and a strong magnetic field. So we know that there's a universe out there to explore, but even better, our surface could be bathed in sunlight. Okay. Mm -hmm. And here's why that's relevant. Just so when earth, when life first gets started on earth, it gets started in the absence of light and the absence of oxygen. It's not like life today. Instead of life today relies on photosynthesis, life at the beginning relied on chemosynthesis, all right? Mm -hmm. So they lived on hydrogen sulfide. But what happens is, and oxygen was deadly to it. What, what happens it is, after a couple of billion years of this, right, you have this ocean of life being bathed in sunlight. The life learns how to use the sunlight for energy. Photosynthesis is born. Mm -hmm. But the byproduct is a poison called oxygen. <laughs> and so the oxygen kills off all that life. And then the life, once it's killed off, it stops producing oxygen. Oxygen levels fall. The life comes back, produces a lot of oxygen, kills itself off again, right? Eventually, it, it results, all this oxygen results in freezing over the planet <laughs> for like, you know, 100 million years of some crazy time period, right? Um, but eventually, volcano because the oxygen broke up the methane that was in the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas, and the temperature plummeted, right? So it took volcanoes to start it back up. But here's the thing. Just like if you expose bacteria to antibiotics, they become antibiotic resistant. That early life became oxygen resistant eventually. And then it learned to use oxygen chemistry. And then you get multicellularity. So it took 2 billion years to get photosynthesis, then another 2 billion years to get oxygen and uh, multicellularity. And it's the last half billion years that we had that Cambrian explosion in ourselves. So what's the bottleneck? Life is going to show up everywhere you got liquids. You know, there's mm -hmm. probably been life on Mars, Enceladus, Titan, Europa. But in order to get macroscopic life, you need to have a transparent atmosphere, and that's extremely rare. When we look around, atmospheres come in one or two types, mostly. Super thick or absent, right? Mm. Mars has like a so atmosphere so thin it looks like it has an atmosphere, but radiation penetrates six feet into the ground. It's so, you know, it doesn't have a strong magnetic field. So why does Earth have a strong magnetic field, but Venus and Mars don't? Two reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one is really large, relatively speaking, okay, compared to Mars. It's twice the size of Mars. So that means the core is still partially molten. It hasn't fully cooled. The second thing is it spins really fast, right? A 24-hour day. And that that circuit, you know, what you know, if you move charged particles, that's called a current. And an electric current creates a magnetic field. Okay. Mm -hmm. So because Earth spins really fast, this molten core 
you know, partially molten core of, 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 of rotating metal creates our strong magnetic field. Venus rotates too slowly. A day on Venus is something like 270 Earth days. Mars is too small, so it doesn't have one. So we happen to be the right distance from the sun, happen to have a transparent atmosphere that's sufficient enough to block radiation in combination with our strong magnetic field, right? Mm -hmm. That is going to be incredibly rare. But the other thing is planets our size are rare. We've discovered 5,000 planets. Most terrestrial worlds, worlds with a solid surface, are what we call super Earths. They're more massive than the Earth is. So that means that if they do evolve to the point of having, you know, multicellular life, they're going to be little incredible hulks, right? <laughs> because gravity is so strong, you have to be short in stature. And because gravity is so strong, you got to be really strong. <laughs> so, you know, the aliens you need to watch out for ain't Thanos, you know, it's a little baby incredible hulk. <laughs> and that's and that's why uh it made me think of the the Plato's cave uh situation that even if there is life on earth because of the uh the non-transparent uh atmosphere they wouldn't know that there are stars and things beyond and but it also makes me think of like you know because we are and i and i've heard you use this kind of analogy like if we were like a cell and you know the the body would we know that we're in a body you know right, and i always right, think right. about like if we like what if we're just a a cell or just like we're like our whole galaxy is like a proton you know in a cell you know in a neuron yeah of in you know almost infinitely sized brain yeah you know, I, neural I, think network. I think that 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 is meritorious uh -huh. <laughs> but the one problem is projecting our reality to that realm. And what we see is, you know, if you look at the three realms, so there's like five realms we talk about as physicists, right? Okay. There's our normal realm of us. <clears throat> then you go down to the microscopic realm of the quantum, where reality is completely different. Yeah. There is no such thing as an object, right? If you think of a proton as a little sphere, yeah. an electron is a little sphere, it's not. OK, mm -hmm. and there's a billion videos you can watch on YouTube <laughs> to, to explain to you how they're spread throughout all space when nothing's looking at it. But then when something looks at it, it's like mm -hmm. localized. Right. And by look at, you know, it means interact with. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in the upper realm, the cosmological realm, there's two things you have to take into account that messes up all of your normal intuition. Mm -hmm. And that is the expansion of the universe, and the other is the curvature of space-time, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, below the realm of the quantum is the realm of the fields, and above the realm of the cosmological is beyond our horizon, right? The observable universe, the shell that we can see, is really small. It's only a million Milky Ways across, right? Our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. You know, if you think about how many molecules of air or in your room, it's mind boggling, right? And it's it's far more than the number of galaxies in the observable universe. If you wanna have a, 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 cause the thing about it is the analogy of air and galaxies is not very far off, it, you know, comparison mm -hmm. to how far apart they are on average compared to their size, galaxies and the air in the room both tend to be like, you know, a thousand times their own size apart from each other, right? which is different from the nuclei in our body, which are hundreds of thousands of times their own size apart from each other. And stars and galaxies are tens of millions of times their own size apart from each other, right? Mm -hmm. So galaxies are kind of like the air in a room. But, you know, there's two trillion galaxies in the observable universe. A trillion is a one with 12 zeros. Mm -hmm. How many air molecules are in my hand right here? Probably like a one with, you know, it's definitely a one with over 20 zeros. Right. Uh -oh. So, you know, our entire galaxy, if you think of it like air is a, is a tiny little element, you know, We're, we are a tiny little nugget of all that exists. Our observable universe has to be a tiny nugget of all that exists. Indeed, uh, I, I appreciate 
you know, um, we went a little bit over time. Mm. And so I, I appreciate every moment of this. Thank you. And you you have given us a lot to discuss, a lot to go back and contemplate. And, you know, and I know people in the chat want me to ask all these questions and we would be here, you know, all night and forever. That. Wow. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I encourage y'all to get his book. And uh, we're talking about Dr. Hakeem Olusheye. Olusheye, yes, I'm sorry. There you go. Uh, A Quantum Life, My Unlikely Journey from the street to the stars. And that's not your only book. Yeah. <clears throat> no. So, you know, a lot, I, you know, I have a lot of technical ones. Um, and uh, there was a children's book called Spaceopedia that I did with Time Life. And it's okay. really hilarious because when I was a kid, my buddy informed me, Darren Brown was his name. He, he ended mm -hmm. up being the second highest ranking African-American in the Navy submarine fleet. He's retired mm -hmm. now. <clears throat> but he was like my childhood hero. He was my mom's best friend, youngest son. He was two years older than me. But he informed me that if you're 18, if you're under 18, you can't be held to a contract. So I would, mm -hmm. you know, order those time life books. You know, you had the card and you, you they send you books and you pay later. So, mm -hmm. so I was robbing time life when I was a kid. And then as an adult, <laughs> I wrote a book with them. <laughs> I don't even want to look at my credit report and see uh, which <laughs> CDs I didn't pay for those, uh, oh, man. those things from back in the day. Hey, back uh, in the street days, man, when they first came out with eight ATMs, yeah. I used to do the trick of deposit an empty envelope and then withdraw the cash. Oh. <laughs> so I didn't know about that trick. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, um, well, because uh, of course, normally I, I uh, send people in the direction of one's website or something like this. Okay. I know, like you know, you're you're a professor, you teach at the university. Right. But do you offer like online classes just to the general public on some of the more <laughs> basic, not they don't need the calculus necessarily? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so I, I did a course, uh, uh, a team course uh -huh. on an organization called Outlier.org. So okay. it's the astronomy course there. And man, that thing sells out so fast every time it goes up. So mm -hmm. get in there. It, it, you know, people love it. So. The show I'm on is called, one of the shows I've been on for a long time is called How the Universe Works. Mm -hmm. So one of the other instructors, you know, people from How the Universe Works love her. Uh, her name is uh, Michelle Thaler. Mm -hmm. uh, we work together at NASA. But, you know, she and I, you know, <laughs> Michelle and I have something in common, right? Mm -hmm. And that is, is that, you know, a lot of times when physicists and astronomers talk they feel, people feel like they're talking down to them. Like, I'm the intellectual who knows everything, and you're but a mere human, right? <laughs> but Michelle and I both are kind of like, you know, hey, I'm I'm like you. Here's what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not no airs, just like, yo, here's what it is. Ain't it awesome? <laughs> Indeed. So, um, so if you want to uh, take the course, check out outliers.com. Outlier.org. O-U-T-L-I-E-R.org. And you can actually get college credit for taking the course. <clears throat> and if they want to, you know, keep up with you and see oh, what you got coming up, you know, where 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 can they uh, find you? So I'm terrible at social media, but I use okay. Twitter. Okay. Uh, Hakeem Olusheyi. I use um, Instagram, HM Olusheyi. I use LinkedIn, Hakeem Olusheyi. Mm -hmm. Primarily those three. All righty. LinkedIn, and Twitter, and Instagram. I will ask this one last question, and because someone asked this earlier, yes, because um, we know your birth name is different right. from the the name that you have now, right? So, what was the inspiration for the change of the name? That's yeah, so it was several, right? One right. was self determination. Hmm. Okay. Um, the other was, you know, I related to my ancestors who I imagine going through something similar to Kunta Kinte, right? Hmm. You know, I imagine my ancestors being like, yo, we're going to do this now, but we're not going to be enslaved forever. <laughs> you know, we're going to. And so, <clears throat> you know, and also at that time, I felt transformed like I was a new person. Right. So I decided I was going to change my name and I wanted to be an African name. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know my ancestry is mixed race at this time. Right. It turns out both my father's grandfathers were white men. Right. They were mm -hmm. Irishmen. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of blue eyes in my family. Mm -hmm. Um 
but you know, I wanted to honor my African heritage. And so my mother's family from New Orleans, they would always say to us, we weren't slaves, we weren't slaves. And of course I didn't believe them because I was like, we black, how we get here then? You know, <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out that my great, great, great grandfather's parents went from Yoruba land to, to, to France. And then he came from France to Santo Domingo where he had my great, great grandfather. And then the two of them moved to New Orleans where then my great grandfather, my grandfather, my mother were born. Mm. So I decided I would take a Yoruba last name. I wanted my middle name to express who I am. And I wanted my first name to express who I wish to become. So mm. my middle name Muata is Swahili and it means seeker of truth. First name Hakeem, everybody knows it, wise, right? What mm -hmm. I seek to become. And you're and, and Olusheyi means God has done this. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is um matter of fact, uh I helped to publish or I did publish this book here for Dr. Chim Chilema Lima Mukinge. Yes. Titled Muntu Wan Zombie. A mm. portrait of man as God's special creation. Mm. He's out of di the Democratic Republic of Congo. Oh. The text he talks about how, amongst the Baluba people in Central Africa, mm. you know, you have your birth name, you have your initiation names, mm. but you also have the name that you give yourself oh. based upon what you think your, you know, uh, who your true being is. And so I see that you have followed, even though, you know, you're more familiar with the Yoruba. Yeah. You, you followed in that that Congolese uh yeah, path. Yeah, that's uh, dope. Yeah. And so that's that's a very bit of, interesting bit of history. Thank but you. Man. Again, I, I thank you greatly uh for uh making it and and sharing your story with us. I hope to have you back in the in the future and maybe we can talk about something more specific. Oh absolutely and but your story is an inspiration. I can't wait to read the text. And um, everyone, make sure that you check out all the programs he's he's involved in and, and look him up on YouTube and watch some of his talks. Check me out and, on Netflix, Make It Impossible. Ah, Make It Impossible. <laughs> make It Impossible or say it Baking again. Impossible. So the show oh, is a yeah. partner of baking, a baker and an engineer, and they have to make cakes that survive challenges. So ah. <laughs> we have a baking judge and I'm the engineering judge. Ah. Yeah. Reminds me of uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, what is her name? It's last name Chang. She's a mathematician. She wrote a book, How to Bake Pie. Uh, well, Joanne Chang is the name of the woman who is the uh, baking judge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If she's a she's a the PhD the same in mathematics. One? But oh, you know. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah but she went yeah. to like some Harvard or something like that. Yeah, I'm like, the, how do you go to Harvard and become a baker? How does that? <laughs> what did you well, major in? Uh, Doctor Chang, um, she is Christi is Christina Chang, uh, I, I believe her name. So Doctor Christina Chang, she wrote a book, How to Bake Pie, mm -hmm. P.I. Of course, yeah, yeah. And but it has actual recipes, and it's it's teaching people, you know, oh, the fundamentals of mathematics yeah. and, and logic and the thing, wow, uh, whatnot. So. The, that's what the first thing that came to my mind when you uh -huh. when you said that That's title. Um, but yes, check out the Netflix special and and everything that he's involved with. Uh, I love hearing you watch your story. Of course, I love hearing the science. And uh, I hope this encourages many of you who are watching and listening to, you know, look a little bit deeper into uh, our, our cosmos and 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 to read a bit. And, and learn about Einstein. So like I'm getting my Einstein on right now, dealing with the mathematics of oh, yeah. relativity for the rest of us. So uh, when when they get deep, deep into it, I can I can follow the conversation uh, with, with ease. So uh, you and your family, thank you for joining us. Um, and, and you be blessed and you have a good night. Good evening, take care. All right, easy. And for everyone else, uh, make sure that you um, love, like, and That is right.
right, make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Again, big up the program by liking and continue to uh, support and share the video and keep the conversation going. Remember that we will be in Detroit on Saturday, uh, April the 30th and Sunday, May the 1st at the Double Tree Hotel for the One Africa Power and Unity Conference. And we'll be talking about all that science and philosophy and language and culture. And this is, you know, ultimately in, in many respects where I, I would like to see more of our people engaged in, and that is in the STEM fields. And we can have the arts and the STEMs uh, working together to make the world a better place and to to help raise the consciousness and the levels of of Africa people worldwide. So y'all be safe in these streets. I got some homework to do. So I will see you next time. Oh, and don't forget that on Sunday, I will be interviewing Dr. Susan Tata. She will also be one of the presenters at the one uh at the the one unity conference in detroit um put together by the creators of the hoppy documentary film uh, where you can go to hoppy.com hoppy excuse me hoppyfilm.com and uh you can purchase your tickets but we will have one of the speakers um, there dr susan tata she has a, a youtube channel called the Pan-African Daily TV. And she deals with uh, business and entrepreneurship and the like. And, and she has a host of, of, of different you know, guests. And I will be a guest on her show on tomorrow at 3.45 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. But she will be on my program live at um, 3 a.m., that's right, 3 a.m. EST or Eastern Standard Time, but it will be 9 a.m. her time in Germany. She's currently in Germany, but she hails originally from uh, Cameroon. So it is going to be uh, a very knowledge-filled conversation. And so I look forward to uh, being hosted and to host uh, Dr. Susan uh, Tata. So make sure y'all check that out and leave your comments and questions in the comment section. And again, hit the like and share the button. Y'all be safe. I will see y'all later. Oh, and tomorrow. So peace.